So welcome to our very first screencast for chapter 14 and in chapter 14 we are going to focus on the flatworms. Now there's several different phyla that actually belong to this group of animals but we are going to focus primarily on the phylum platyhelminthes. So when looking at this group of animals it's really important for us to understand that they have actually two major evolutionary advances when compared to the animals that we had talked about in chapter 12, the sponges, and the animals that we had looked at in chapter 13, the cnidarians. And the first evolutionary advantage is something called cephalization. And when you talk about cephalization, you're basically talking about an animal that now has a very defined head region. Now, because these animals have a defined head region, we're now talking about an area of the body where you can concentrate various sense organs. Now these animals also have something called primary bilateral symmetry and this prefix bi is going to refer to two. And so we're looking at an animal that now can be divided along only one plane of symmetry. Now when you divide this animal in one plane it actually produces or yields two mirror images. And a good example of this is on the right hand side. If you look at the butterfly, we have taken this butterfly and we have divided this butterfly in two. Now when we did that, you're going to notice that we have parts on each side that are very similar to each other. In other words, they are mirror images of each other. We have one antenna on this side, we have one on this side, we have one upper wing on this side, an upper wing on this side, we have a lower wing on this side, and a lower wing on this side. So again, they are the same parts, but they're considered mirror images of each other. Kind of similar to what you would see if you looked in a mirror, and if you had any type of printed uh, material on maybe a t-shirt, how that material would be reversed. Now, these animals are one of the first groups of animals that actually have a very active, directed type of movement. Now, this is important because when you look at the body of these animals, this is the first time where you can actually look at an animal and pick out or identify an anterior region or a head region, a posterior or a tail region, a dorsal region, and a ventral region of the animal. So if you think about, for example, if we went ahead and let's say created an animal, all right? And when you look at this animal, you're going to notice that we definitely have what we consider a head region in this animal. This would be the anterior region of the animal. Now we also of course have a very defined tail region or posterior region of the animal. Now when you look at dorsal and ventral, dorsal is going to be here. So dorsal is going to be on top and here is going to represent the ventral region of the animal. So this is the very first time that we actually have animals where we have identified regions of the animal. Now in addition to the two evolutionary advantages that we had looked at in the previous slide, it's also really important for us to recognize that now we have animals that are considered triploblastic. Now when we looked at the Nidarians, that was the first group of animals that actually were considered diploblastic. In other words, they had two germ layers, but now these animals actually have three germ layers. Again, the prefix tri refers to three. Now these three germ layers are identified as being ectoderm, endoderm, and again we saw these two with the Nidarians, but we have a third called mesoderm, and this mesoderm is very well defined in the flatworms. Now these animals are also sometimes called acelomates. Now they're called acelomates because they have only one internal space, and that internal space is called the digestive cavity, kind of similar to the gastrovascular cavity we had looked at in the cnidarians. Now the region between the epidermis of the animal, which is going to be identified by this blue region right through here, and the digestive cavity is going to be called the parenchymal layer because it's filled with parenchyma. So looking at this um, diagram down here, you can recognize the three different germ layers. We have the ectoderm here, which is primarily responsible for forming this outer epidermal layer. We have the endoderm, which is located here, which is going to be responsible for forming the lining of the gut. And then we have, again, the mesoderm, which is going to produce that parenchymal layer that basically fills in the space between the epidermis 
and this um, gut region that you see right here. Right? So again, these animals are considered triploblastic and sometimes they are referred to as being acelomates because again, they only have one internal space. Now again, I had said that um, there are several different phyla that actually belong to the um, group called flatworms, but we are going to focus primarily on the platyhelminthes. So some of the general characteristics of platyhelminthes are, first off, as we had said, they are considered flatworms. Um, they can vary from about a millimeter in length to actually many meters in length. If you think about some of the tapeworms that we're going to talk about, they can get quite large. Some of them can be free living and some of them can be parasitic. In fact, quite a few of them can be parasitic. The word free living basically means that they go out and they consume other organisms within their environment, but they're not parasitic. Um, the one that you see right down here, this is a planarian. This is a kind of similar to one that you guys will look at in class. This is considered a free living type of flatworm. Over here on the right hand side we have an example of a tapeworm and of course this one definitely would be considered a parasitic type of um, flatworm. Um, another group that would fall into the parasitic category would be the um, flukes. Those are also considered parasitic flatworms. So in addition to the um, general characteristics we had looked at in the previous slide, it's also very important to note these animals have a very obvious or defined epidermal layer. Now in addition to this epidermis, they actually also have a very well-defined muscular layer as well. So this is the very first group that we've looked at that actually has more than one kind of muscle tissue. Um, most of them will have cellular or a ciliated type of epidermis. And you can see the epidermis right here in our diagram. So that's going to be this yellow layer that you see outlined here. And this right here is a cross-section of the planaria on the left-hand side. Now within that epidermis you're going to have what we call rod-shaped rhabdites. All right? And the rhabdites are located right here and it's kind of hard to see them um, right in this area right here. Now these rhabdites are going to swell and they're going to form what we consider a protective mucus sheath around the animal. Now again it's protective in terms of it's going to protect it maybe from other types of animals and possibly even protect it from disease, maybe infection within its environment. Now most turbellarians, which again fall in this category of platyhelminthes, um, have a what we call a dual gland adhesive organ. And this dual gland adhesive organ, which you can see right down here, it's kind of represented by this kind of purple structure right here, actually contains three different types of cells. It has what we call a viscid gland cell, it has an anchor cell, and it also has a releasing gland cell. Now over here on the right hand side, this is an example, kind of a close-up view, of this dual gland adhesive organ. And you can see the viscid glands located right here. So it's going to be these special cells right here. You can see the anchor cells, which are going to be right here. And you can also see that releasing gland right here. So what happens with these organs is that these viscid gland cells are going to fasten those microvilli which are found on the anchor cells to the substrate. So that's going to be the, um, the surface that that animal is on. And that's going to allow that animal to, to remain secure. Now once the animal needs to release itself from that substrate, these special releasing glands that you see right here are going to provide a quick chemical detachment from the surface. So there's going to be a chemical reaction that occurs that allows it to be able to release rather quickly from that surface. So now when you talk about nutrition and digestion in the phylum platyhelminthes, it's important to note that it's, it's quite varied when it comes down to this group of animals. Um, again, we have both free living and we have parasitic members that belong to this, um, this particular group. Now the cestodes, which are going to be represented by the tapeworms, basically have no digestive system. It's not necessary because they live within um, another animal. So basically the animal does the digesting for the cestode or the tapeworm. Now the others that we're going to talk about definitely do have a very well-defined mouth. They definitely have a pharynx. And again, we'll talk about the pharynx in just a second. And they have a very well-defined intestine. Now in the planarians, like the ones you're going to look at in class, the pharynx that's found in this animal, which is kind of a, a juncture or a, a part of the animal that's between the mouth and the intestine, is going to be able to extend through the ventral mouth of the animal. So what's kind of unique about the planarians is that they don't have an anterior mouth. Their mouth is actually located on the bottom of the animal's body. 
Now if you look at the intestine of planarians, it actually has three branches. It's going to have one anterior and two posterior branches. Now the gastrovascular cavity of these animals is going to be lined with what we call columnar epithelium. Now don't get too concerned about this word columnar. It basically means cells that look somewhat like this. So again, this is going to be the tissue that's going to line the digestive cavity. Now the mouth of trematodes, which are a parasitic type of flatworm that's found within this group, actually opens near the anterior region of the animals. So the trematodes are a little bit different from the planarians. Remember we talked about the planarians of having a ventral mouth. Well the trematodes have a mouth that's more anterior on the animal's body. And in this case also the trematodes do not have a pharynx that is what we call extensible. In other words it's not going to be able to extend from the animal's body. But again the planarians did have a pharynx that could extend through that mouth. Now the intestines of both do end blindly. So they don't have actually a terminating pore or opening where waste material can be removed. And again, depending on the type of um, flatworm that you're looking at, um, the, the amount of branching that you see with these intestines is definitely going to vary. So the two diagrams that we have here are going to work to basically compare the digestive systems of the planarian, which is going to be the one that you see on top, and the trematodes, sometimes called the flukes, which is the one that you see on the bottom. If you look at the planarian on top, you're going to notice again the digestive system is going to start here. And again, remember we had said they have a single anterior um, intestine that's going to branch off into two separate tubes. But as we had said before, it's considered a blind ending tube, which means we do not have a pore or an opening where this tube will empty out of. And as we had said before, the pharynx of planarians is going to be able to extend. And again, the extension of that pharynx is going to help that animal feed. And it's going to extend through the mouth of the animal, which again, the mouth is going to be ventral in planarians. Now when you talk about the trematodes or the flukes, they have something called an oral sucker, which is going to surround the mouth region of the animal. And this particular oral sucker, again, is going to have a pharyngeal muscle, which is going to help to constrict the pharynx region of the animal. But again, when you look at the intestine, the intestine, again, it's, it's pretty short in the flukes, but it still branches into two separate intestines. And again, after it branches, it's still going to end blindly at the anterior region of the animal. Now when talking about the feeding behavior of animals that are found within the phylum platyhelminthes, um, it's really important to understand that when you talk about the first group, planarians, remember that we had considered those animals free living, which means that these animals actually have to go out into their environment and basically feed. They have to collect their own food. And planaria are considered carnivorous, so they do not eat any type of plant matter. Now what they're going to do is they're going to detect their food by use of what we call chemoreceptors. So they're going to pick up specific chemicals within their environment that will help direct them to their food source. Now this food is going to be trapped in the mucus secretions from the glands that we had talked about earlier that are found in the rhabdites. Now they're going to wrap themselves around their prey and when they extend their proboscis, which again is often referred to as the pharynx of the animal, they're going to use this extension to help suck up the bits of food that they find within their environment. Now when you talk about the trematodes, as we had said, these animals are primarily parasites. And when you're a parasite, that means that you either live on or in your host. Now these animals are going to feed on the host cells. They could possibly feed on any of the cellular debris, which means the waste products that are produced by the cells, and they can also feed on the body fluids of their host. Now when these animals digest their food, they're going to digest their food by means of enzymes that are secreted from the intestine. And when they secrete these enzymes, it's kind of like the acids that we secrete in our own stomach. That's going to start the digestive process. And when you start that digestive process, you are talking about extracellular digestion, which means digestion that occurs on the outside of the cell. Now, phagocytic cells are going to be used that are found in the gastrodermis to complete digestion. And this completion is going to occur at the intracellular level. So again, this is going to be on the inside of the cell. 
So kind of similar to what we had talked about in terms of phagocytosis um, with the protozoans and of course with the um, sponges and even the cnidarians, these cells are going to basically take in the material that has been broken down to begin with through extracellular digestion in these enzymes and finish up the process. Now undigested food is going to be passed out through the pharynx of the animal. Remember we had said these animals have a blind gut. They have a blind digestive system. So any food that's taken in has to be taken out through the same opening. Now the cestodes or the tapeworms on the other hand they do not, as we had said earlier, have any type of digestive system. So they basically rely on their host digestive tract to digest the food and they simply absorb those digested nutrients. So the very last thing we need to look at is the process that these animals use to both excrete waste and to regulate the amount of fluid or ions found inside of the animal. So flatworms have something called a protonephridia. So this is a special organ that's going to be used to regulate those fluids. Now this is a term that we had looked at earlier in the um, year. We had talked about something called osmoregulation. We talked about this with the protozoans. Um, the protozoans had special parts, special organelles that were used to regulate the fluid inside of the cell. We had talked about the contractile vacuole in paramecium to regulate that fluid. Well, when you talk about flatworms, they have protonephridia, which take care of this process. So when you talk about osmoregulation in terms of flatworms, we talk about a special type of cell called a flame cell. Now these flame cells have flagella, and these flagella are basically used to drive or push fluids down special collecting ducts. And as they push these fluids down these collecting ducts, there are going to be special folds or what we call microvilli to reabsorb any ions or molecules that are found within those tubes or those ducts. Anything that the animal might still need are going to be taken back into the animal. Anything that is not needed is going to empty at a special pore or opening in the animal called a nephridia pore. All right, so this is going to be the opening to let go of any material that the animal does not need. Now, if we're talking about metabolic waste, in other words, we're not talking about the regulation of fluids or ions, we're talking about any type of waste that is produced after the animal has fed, then the majority of metabolic waste are going to be released simply by the process of diffusion. And this diffusion will take place across the body wall. So this is going to finish up the first of three screencasts for Chapter 14. As always, please make sure that you have completed your study guide before you come to class.